me, Nada. Nella, because <laughs> I always forget to record. Okay, so now we're recording. Um, so Nella, go ahead and put those in. There's a slideshow, a Google slideshow that you're free to um, download and save a copy for yourself or just watch mine and get it later. And then there's a handout we're going to look at later also with like a sample assessment. So Nella put both of those into the chat box. And if you've been here before, you'll notice the tiny URLs sort of have a pattern. It's, the, it's always the date a hyphen and then WLC for World Language Culture and then either in today there's two so there's an extra two at the end of it. All right so while you're getting ready to get those but and I'm sort of setting up my screen I'd like everybody in the chat box put in your favorite movie in the chat box. Mine's Casablanca. I know it I've seen it a hundred times I know the entire entire script by by heart so put your favorite movie in the chat box while I'm getting ready here. I just glanced over the chat box. I'm like, Star Wars, all. <laughs> yeah, that's you and my son. All right, so that's just sort of another, again, sort of thinking of those things about, you know, when, if you're starting a session with your classroom about just fun things to do. Like yesterday, it was sort of like, describe your life right now in two words. What's a favorite movie? Just stuff like that to sort of get everyone feeling a little bit of, of community within their own oh, inception. That's a scary one. That was a freaky one. I'm just glancing over there. Okay, so if on my screen, you can see my... PowerPoint or my slideshow. So like I said, you can, you can download this or you can download it later if you don't want to do it right now. So our focus today is on online translators and reimagining assessment. And so really the thread sort of as this topic has come up so many times throughout, I think not just now that we're remote, but even more so now that we're remote and kids aren't right in front of us, because before we could sort of do the assessment right in the classroom so we could make sure they weren't using it. But now it's like they're remote and we have no idea. So like I said, I was joking before that there's like a 100% infallible answer because there's not, but we can at least think of some stuff. But one of the things is to think about is that, is it our method as the teacher, the way we're, we're designing formative and summative assessment, are we encouraging the use of online translators by the design of our assessment? So that, that's what we're gonna talk about, share some ideas and stuff today. Um, okay. Uh, okay, first thing I want you to do in, in the chat box, I warned Terry, Terry and Nella help me with the chat box, is um, the chat box is going to be crazy today. So the first thing I want you to do in the chat box is for online translators, I want you to put in the chat box, why do kids use online translators? I'll give you about 30 seconds. Why do students use online translators? I'm trying to like follow chat. I can't even keep up with it. So I think it's like, it, it's easy. They don't want to think. They don't want to use their brain. Lazy, it's easy. They want to be perfect. Um, they feel insecure in their ability for clarification. They don't feel confident. It's at their fingertips. They want to say more than they're able to. Fear of a bad grade. They're used to find, well, they're used to finding everything online. They're scared to do it on their own, easier than thinking. They, they think it's easier, they don't have the vocabulary, they want reassurance, they get stuck thinking in the first language, they want to be able to, I, and I think one of them is, it, part of it might be some kids are just like always trying to find the easy way out, but I think looking at these, uh, some of them are that kids, they want to have good grades, they want to show that they know more than they can because unskilled, unsure of their skills and just sort of going through um, easily accessible technology generation. Exactly. So there's tons and tons of, they think we don't know they're using them. Yes. When you use the past, you know, the past plus que parfait when you're a novice low, I, I'm pretty sure you're in a, in a translator there. So, um, and I think part of it is if we look at that piece, especially about kids wanting to be perfect or they don't want to um, have a bad grade or they don't, they want to say more than they can is it goes, you know, if we think about going back to learning a new language, if you've ever gone beyond the one that you're, you're fluent in, is it's such a humbling experience to learn a new language. I mean, you can't say anything, you speak in, in words, and as, especially as middle schoolers and teenagers, 
and adults even, it's very embarrassing to not be able to express your thoughts. And so part of it, you know, I said, obviously there's more to it than that, but part of it is really that kids want to, I think they want to show us that, you know, don't think I'm dumb or something because I can't say much or whatever. Okay. But there's tons and tons of reason, right? Translate your question you did. Okay. So, um, yeah, the, the tiny URLs, you have to actually copy and paste it or type it in. You, you can't click on it in the chat box. Oh, yeah, and sorry, yeah, they're two separate ones. Okay, so why do students use them? So I think we're, we're pretty much on board with that. Now I want you to put in the chat box, why don't you want students to use an online translator? I'll give you about 30 seconds. All right, tons of answers. Basically getting down to, we don't know what they can do. It's like, man, can't get this. Okay. It does, you know, they don't remember what to say. They're not learning anything. I want to know their abilities. The biggest thing is, you know, our goal is in, a, in school is to help our students learn. And if they're using a, a translator, they're not really learning anything. Okay. You want that we want them to, you know, acquire the language and know the language and know how to do it, rely on their existing knowledge, Jackie. They're not going through the process. Love it because that's sort of what we're talking about today. Okay, and then, and again, part of it is just that understanding that you don't have to be perfect, you don't need to know everything. And so those are, um, they lose the opportunity to make their brain access. This might be a good activity to do with your students, you know, if um, maybe not the first day of school, because some kids may be like, oh, I didn't even know there was Google Translate. But maybe if you see that it's an issue or later on, just ask the kids, hey, how come you guys use translators? And this is the reason I don't want you to use them. And so how can we work this out? So a lot of times it's sort of, uh, you know, sort of like with our kids, you think we know how to fix the problem, but maybe we don't understand even why they're doing what they're doing. Okay. So again, it's just, this is just sort of a norming thing to figure out. Let's get in the main, main, or I'm sorry, the mind of a kid and ourselves and figure out what, what's going on. Okay. So now we're actually going to go to a Mentimeter because this one I want to actually have on a screen so we can all look at it at once versus the chat box. So go ahead and go to Menti. You can just do this on your phone. Go to menti.com and you'll see, I'm going to switch my screen here. Stop sharing and get to a different screen. Um, let me get you the code to that. Oops. Hang on for a second. I got to get out of my, I got to stop sharing. Sometimes I do this and I totally lose like where I am. Let's see here. Okay, there we go. So I'm going to put up a mentee to put your put your answers in. I'm just trying to sorry get to my sharing my screen. There we go. Okay, sorry about that. All right, so I'm going to share my screen. So if you go to menti.com, let me make this a little bit bigger for you so you can see it. Okay, go to menti.com. You can see the code at the top of the page. So menti.com, 8757.28. And I know some of you put your stuff in the chat box. If you wouldn't mind copying and pasting it and, and putting it back on the screen so we could see it. Sorry about that. Yeah, so what are we going to do about online translators? So go ahead and put it onto put it onto the screens. And because the, the thing about Menti that I mentioned before is that we can save this as a PDF and then I'll attach it with the notes. So whatever you put in the chat box, go ahead and put it up on the into Menti. <laughs> I love the first one. I have no idea. No idea. Okay. All right. Hey, we're all being honest with each other. That's okay. It's funny. <laughs> And like I said, if you would put something in the chat and wouldn't mind just copying and pasting it into the mentee or sort of summarizing it in there too. I, I'll do both. I'll copy the chat and the screen. All right. So teach them how to use it, show them acceptable and unacceptable uses, design assess assignments differently. Um, we have to learn with it, lived it with it. They're here to stay. And that's exactly right. They're here to stay. So we've got to figure out what we're going to do. That's why I'm here. <laughs> yeah, that's no pressure on that one. Thank you. I don't know, they're here, the students use them. We have to make sure assessments are appropriate, make students redo the work, alternate assessments, teach circumlocution, show how it can mess them up, not give credit, 
teach acceptable use of them, only assess speaking. <laughs> yeah, that's one way to get around it, right? Um, be explicit about when they might be useful because it is true. It's not like Google Translate is never useful. It is, because you can use, I don't know if you've been in there lately, but you can make it to like make, kids can use it to make sets of flashcards where they have the pronunciation and the flashcards for phrases. I mean, it's sort of like Quizlet, but um, Google Translate, you can just do it right there. So they're, you know, let them look at them under circumstances, make them sign an oath. I mean, there's all things, Right. Why aren't 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 they? Um, let me see. Why don't we think they're good references on assessments and that they don't rely on them exactly? Mm -hmm. Google Translate is just easier and faster. Instruct them on the do's and don'ts. Scaffold the kids. More live assessment. Educate students. Yeah. I mean, this is just not just a, a, a like a power struggle we have with students. It's actually also a life skill, a learning skill that you can't. I hate to say you can't just rely on things online because that's the problem is they have grown up getting everything online. They've never had to actually, you know, go to a library and research things. So, but again, there's a difference between using Google Translate to be able to say a few words being if you're with a native speaker, you're, you know, um, someone you just met here or traveling, you're not gonna be able to pull out Google Translate every time you want to do something because you, you'd never be able to actually have a conversation. Use them for power, not for laziness. Ooh, I like that. Um, Show them how funny it can be. Yeah, there's all sorts of videos about like it translated in like 16 different languages or some music video. We have a, a clause in our syllabi that uh, you get a zero with that. So sometimes it really is just a, okay, it's a compliance issue. Make a pledge, require more um, weight to content over form, expand the vocab. Exactly. So there's lots of ways. It's, it's funny as I'm looking at this, is there's some positive things to do about show them appropriate ways to use it. There's some things more compliance of like, you know, we got to set up a rule and you can't use it. So all sorts of things on there. And there's no, that's why I was saying, there's really not one right answer. It's just, you know, there's different things to do. Okay. Let me see if I can get out of, get out of this. There we go. Okay. And I want to get back to my PowerPoint. Okay. I think everyone has a little bit. Okay. All right, so they're here to stay. What are we gonna do about it? So we've done a little bit of brainstorming. And again, there's no right or wrong answer. That's just sort of what we're gonna talk about today. Okay, so let's move on now to assessment because the whole, and the whole frame of talking about assessment, I want us all to keep in mind this whole Google Translate and online translator issue because the two, as I mentioned in the beginning, the two really are, are connected. And so every time we're talking about assessment today, it's also through the lens of Google Translator and online translator. Exactly. Okay. All right. So a couple, I always like to give you re, um, references where, where all this information is coming from. And I like to give you quick things. If you've ever heard of Visible Learning by John Hattie, amazing, amazing book. He, um, he did like thousands and thousands of studies about the top 256 or something like that thing, um, um, or parts of school that affect student achievement. So it's a great book if you're like, I don't have time to read a book. There's, he has, there's two websites, visiblelearning.com and then this is visiblelearning.org. Both of them are just very um, straightforward about quick information about, visit, about visible learning. This website called Lead, Learn, Serve, and Blog by Dr. Brian Bullis, he has great stuff in there also about visible learning. So if you're like, I wanna know a little bit about it, I don't, have, I don't have time to read a book, I would like to give you some quick references that are easier. Oops, if you're looking for a book, sorry, I keep, uh, oops, I am going the wrong way on my PowerPoint. Sorry about that. There we go. So you could read the book, Visible Learning for Teachers. It is, it is sort of a big book. Um, there's always, you know, Carol Ann Tomlinson, um, her assessment and student success, and always all the stuff by Marzano. So that's where the information we're talking about today, that's where a lot of this is coming from. So you've got some quick reads on there and you've got some longer reads. Okay. So. The second thing is if you were in the workshop yesterday on universal design for learning, that was sort of the, the, um, like the mindset and the framework that the rest of the things we're going to do throughout the series focus on. Because now, as I mentioned yesterday, if you were here, we're getting into some of the more hands-on when I'm actually in the classroom, what am I going to do? So I'm just going to give a really quick, like, you know, three slide overview of UDL from yesterday. If you weren't here, if you are, hopefully it'll be a little refresher. Or I know yesterday was sort of overwhelming because it was a lot at once. If you missed yesterday, um, like I said, by the end of today, I'll have posted the yesterday's handouts and everything so you can go back and see it. But basically, just in a nutshell, and I even tried to highlight in red for you so you can see the, you can see the important parts. Um, yeah, we had a really quick question, which oh, I yeah. think is a good yeah. point. You might talk about this later, but 
Uh, Dan wanted to know how you deal with situations where it is obvious that a student has used a translator but they deny it when confronted and parents may well defend their child. Um, I'm Anna, that. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Anna actually has some good suggestions where, but mostly she said, hopefully the administrator will support the professor or, you know, the professional expertise. Yeah, but I'm throwing that right, I'm throwing that right back out to the group because yeah. you're in the classroom right now and that has happened to everybody. So help, who, whoever, I forget who you said, ask that. Give, give me some suggestions of, of what you said about Dan, I think you said. What Dan, do you do when the kids flat out deny it? So, okay, so yeah, I totally delegated that one off. <laughs> okay, so UDL, quick, uh, quick, uh, refresher. It comes from the concept of, of designing buildings that eliminate barriers like ramps and handrails and closed captioning or any type of environment. UDL, the second bullet, exact same thing. We're trying to create an environment, oops, my goodness, I'm sorry, an environment where students have a variety of ways to access it so there's no barriers to learning. And then the third bullet is so the only way to do that is to anticipate, learn about, and plan for the needs that our kids are going to have and how do we get rid of these barriers. So literally, if you, if you sort of are, the easiest way to wrap your head around it is think of a building and the way they change buildings so everybody can access it. That's exactly what we're trying to do. Not quite as easy or straightforward, but at least an idea. Okay, the good thing is that we know, as we talked about yesterday, that there are typical variabilities or barriers or needs that kids have when they're learning a language, whether it's anxiety, literacy in the first, lang literacy in the first language, Google Translate, heck, we know that's gonna be something we're gonna have to deal with. Cognitive differences, exactly. So it's not like we're going into this blank and we have no idea what the needs of our students are. There are things, I mean, when we opened this yesterday, the chat box, we must have 50 things that came up that people are like, yes, this is what I see with my learners. Okay, so that's the good thing. If you look at the second bullet. So we know typical areas that kids struggle with when they're learning a second language. E even some of the things we said earlier about kids want to be perfect. They want to be able to express their thoughts. So the goal of UDL is that we design to the edges. So we try to create a context that has a lot of different learning opportunities in it so we can address these, these variabilities. Um, <laughs> Talking like kindergartners, yeah, I'm just sort of glancing at the chat box. And then the third point, very, very important, UDL is not differentiated instruction. If you were here yesterday, we talked about that. Un differentiated instruction is where I look at every student's individual needs and try and come up with a specific learning context for that student's perceived needs or labels or whatever. And that is just like frightening to all of us because it's like, how can you, you can't do that. It's impossible. So UDL is going beyond that. So it's not differentiated instruction. UDL, if you go into the next one, as you recall from the video yesterday, it's like having adjustable seats in a car. You don't just have one place for a seat. You have it so if you're short, you're tall, you're heavy, you're skinny, you're whatever, you can adjust your seat. It's similar to, I didn't say this yesterday, but it's another good analogy. It's like having a buffet style dinner. So if you invite a bunch of people over, you can't make 10 different meals because someone's gluten free and someone is allergic to this and someone has this issue. You can make a buffet and then they choose what they want to eat based on their preferences. So what we're trying to do is basically that. We're trying to make like an adjustable buffet style learning context where kids choose and adjust their own learning. And that's autonomy. And that's one of the big questions I've seen has come up in the chat box throughout all of the meetups is the kids don't know how to do stuff on their own. They don't know how to be independent learners. And again, if a student in your class doesn't know how to be an independent learner, it's not the student's fault. It's that, they, well, I shouldn't say it's never the student's fault. They may just be like, I don't want to do it. But again, we have to make sure we're teaching them how to be independent learners, especially with what's happening in the fall is that all, and we're going to talk about this in a little bit, that face-to-face -face time has to be prioritized that when I have those kids in the beginning of the year, the first thing I'm doing is teaching them, how do we use Zoom together? How do we use the online platform? How do you do remote learning when I'm not with you? That's the only way they're going to be able to become autonomous and, and develop that self-efficacy is if we take the time to teach them. And then the last thing we talked about with UDL was that type of support we provide because um, you know, when we got all these different contexts, it's like, how much, you know, how do I address all this? So if you recall, there was the tier one support where we look at all those variabilities we talked about, like anxiety and pronunciation, and if they have, you know, physical disabilities or whatever. And we try to create a broad range of instruction and opportunity that a lot of different kids can access. That's sort of the buffet. And the more buffet you do in the tier one, 
the less you need for tier two. So tier two is when you actually have to add even more support for individual kids who might have a specific need. Maybe there's a, a student who is blind in your class, and so you have to have specific needs that have to be addressed a certain way. So basically, tier one is sort of a, a gigantic buffet. Tier two is if we can't figure out any, there's nothing in the buffet that works for the kids, we might have to add a little separate meal for the kids. Tier three is when you get to kids who are on an IEP, Title I, things that really are beyond your ability in the classroom, that's when you need to go beyond yourself. Don't think that you have to handle everything in the classroom. There are times when you really need to go to tier three support, and that's when you get outside help from the IEP or the school. Oh yeah, that might, I'm looking at the chat. Yeah, that buffet, I can't, I can't believe I forgot that yesterday because that's a, a really great idea. So yeah, we're basically making buffet learning for the kids. All right, so that was just a little, and then, oh, and then the last part of UDL. So just remember, um, there was three parts of UDL. There was the engagement that we try to come up with a lot of ways to engage the kids and get them motivated. We present the material representation a lot of different ways. So here's, you know, different ways to access the materials, whether it's a video or text or whatever. And then the third one, which is sort of where assessment falls in, is we give them a lot of different ways that they can express what they know. And that's what assessment is. Assessment is the kids showing us what they know. Okay, keep going here. All right, so I'm sure you've probably seen, <laughs> you've probably seen this cartoon or not. It's, it's really aimed at standardized testing, but you got all these animals and he's like, okay, we're gonna do, to make everything fair, we're gonna do the same exam. Everybody has to climb that tree. So you look at the monkey and the monkey's like, sweet, or the bird are like, yeah, sweet, but everyone else is like, the goldfish like, what the heck? Right, exactly. So it's sort of a cartoon that was going around about one size fits all does not work in schools. We've got too many individuals. Okay, so I just threw that one in there. Kathy, I was looking up a little bit on the, in chat and Maria Herman put a share. So she wanted to share. Oh, sorry. Earlier. Yeah, Maria, jump in real quick. Okay. I was just going to answer that question, but I think he read everything. Uh, what I do when students translate, um, it, use a translator, I say, come over here, can you read this out loud to me? Because they don't know their own words when they use a translator. I'm like, what are you trying to say? And they're like, uh. <laughs> Perfect. All right, good. Yeah, that, that, uh, I swear I know all these words. Okay, so let's keep going. So what I want you to do in, and this one is just in the chat box. So just in the chat box, how do you define assessment? Did you put this one in the chat box? What's assessment to you? I love the celebration of knowledge, shows what they've learned, determining what a student knows, evaluate their skills, verify, measure progress. What do they know? What can you produce? What's their knowledge? It's a checkpoint. What can they do? What can they do? What are their skills? What can we do? Tool to demonstrate what they've learned. Exactly. Right, exactly. It's all about what do you know? What can you do? What have you learned? What do you understand? Could be a measurement or a snapshot exactly of where they are currently. What do they know? What do they know? What do they know? Exactly. So I think we're all on board with assessment is that's how we find out where students are. What do they know? All right, so I'll go back to the screen while you're still filling in there. All right, so basically, um, it's, what I have on here is pretty much exactly what, what you put in there, is that it's gathering information to evaluate progress toward a goal, period. That's it. I'm just, I have a goal. Where are you in the process? So if you look at this box underneath, the things to take about, think about is it has to be goal driven. So when I assess you, I have to have a reason for that goal. If the goal of the outcome is that you can compare cultural celebrations in my own and another culture, then I need to make sure my assessment is leading towards that goal. It has to be driven by feedback. So if I'm giving you an assessment and it's giving me feedback, then that feedback should inform the next assessment I give, okay? The feedback to the students, but also the students giving feedback to me. So the feedback is not just for the students. It, and actually, I, Marzano, and I don't know if we'll get to this or not today, the feedback is also just important for the teacher to know about how is my instruction going as well as what the student's learning. Progress driven, exactly. So the assessment should be, am I helping the student make progress towards the goal? If I keep giving the same assessment over similar things and they've mastered it, they're really not progressing. The second column is that it's ongoing. So assessment is not a one-time thing at the end of the unit, it's ongoing. There's formative, there's formative assessment throughout. You could have a summative assessment that's stretched out. 
it's flexible, which is what we're talking about with UDL. It's that there's a lot of different ways that students can do it. And it's dynamic, which means that, okay, I had this one thing in mind, but then after I saw what happened, I changed it. I sort of was telling Nayla and Ryan and Terry afterwards yesterday with the breakout rooms, I realized some people were like, yes, the breakout rooms were great. We talked and other people were like, wait a minute, though, I didn't even know how to do it or I didn't have the handout. And so, I, so if I do breakout rooms again, that's going to inf that feedback is going to inform me on how to do it. So just another way of showing you that, yeah, there's, it's an ongoing process for all of us. All right, so that's what assessment is. All right, this, and if you download the PowerPoint, I put the link to this in the notes. This is from the ODE website, and it's our backward design template for world languages. And it says of a thematic unit, but it's really any type of backward design in general. So if you are familiar with... Um, uh, McTeague and Wiggins and their backward design process, it's really just three things. So UDL, remember, is the mindset of providing all the opportunities. Backward design is sort of now let's get into the actual process of planning the actual activities, okay? So basically, the first thing we do is we figure out what's the outcome. What do I want my kids to do in this unit? And that outcome's like they can conjugate verbs or they can use the past tense, but actual true language and cultural outcomes. So my students can talk about something from their childhood, which is going, it's, so that gives a reason. It's not just they can use the past tense because who cares if they can use the past tense, but if it's they're talking about their childhood, okay, now they can. Um, and so you can look at essential questions and our new standards and themes and topics and can do's and what's the proficiency level. So if you don't have your outcome, you might as well not even plan the rest of the lesson because then you don't know what, you don't know where you're going. The second part of backward design is acceptable evidence, and that could be a summative performance assessment. We have IPA on here, but there's more than just IPAs. But basically, it's going to be some sort of performance assessment that involves authentic resources, the three modes of communication. It's, it's graded with rubrics because it's going to be performance. It's not like a discrete criteria referenced um, um, type of test. And then the third part is that we just plan learning experiences. So once we know the outcome, we know what's going to be the evidence that they met the outcome, now we actually plan what we're going to teach. And that includes, if you look at the bubbles, formative assessment, language functions, authentic resources, vocab and structures, prior knowledge, comprehensible input, all of that. And if you sort of look at this, this is like as a summary of what happens in a language classroom. So if people are like, oh my God, teaching a language is so easy, show them this visual and say, oh my gosh, no, it's not. And we could do all the sub bubbles from that third one on top of it. So, but this is just a very simple graphic that talks about what do I want my kids to do? What's the proof or what's the evidence they can do it? And then how am I going to get them there? That's really all it gets down to. And it takes away sort of the fear factor or the right or wrong factor for, for kids, because it's not that I've got to get it right. And they're, and you know, and if I don't get it right, I'm wrong. It's like, no, it's all about, it's a process of feedback of helping you make progress towards a goal. So think of assessment that way. It's just like you all said in there, what have you learned? And it's the progress and helping you grow. That's really it. It's not a right or wrong. All right. I'm going to give you an example. Um, and your PowerPoint, if you download it, I took out some of the pictures of like me in that because I didn't really want those out there floating around. So your, your version took out all the people pictures. But basically, when we plan a trip, we, you, we use backward design in everything we do in life. Whenever you are going to do a project, you think of, okay, what's the goal I want in the project? What's it going to look like? And then you start figuring out how to do it. So for example, my, my daughter, and um, ever since she was a baby, I had saved, put away a little bit of money every month so I could take her on sort of a trip of a lifetime when she graduated from high school. Which, um, so we did this last year when she, after she graduated and she chose and she said she wanted to go to Hawaii so we knew the outcome was that we wanted to go to Hawaii and learn everything we could about Hawaii I'm so glad we went last year because now the <laughs> but so we wanted to just experience everything we could in Hawaii we had 10 days we wanted to do everything we could that was our outcome that's what we were aiming for what was our evidence and I put some pictures up there to show the evidence like we knew we wanted to swim with turtles she wanted to take a surf lesson she wanted to go horseback riding on the beach I'm a big birder I'm like I got to do as much birding as I can while I'm in Hawaii we wanted to swim swim in the shark cage and there was a ton of other stuff so to us that was the proof that we met our goal of having this trip of a lifetime to Hawaii was these activities that we planned plus a zillion more so then once we knew what we wanted to do when we were in Hawaii, then we started planning. So we were on TripAdvisor, we were on Wahoo, we were going to Wahoo travel forums. We had to look at our budget because I'm like, this is how much money we have. And so we got to fit it in there. We looked at, you can see like shark, we, we you know, compared prices and times for different um, adventures. The web, and, and so that was sort of our, you know, our planning, but we also had to do a lot of flexibility when we were there because one thing we didn't think about when we got to Hawaii was the effect of the wind because everything we wanted to do in the water 
could get canceled for wind speed. So we had never looked at wind speed in our life, except maybe there's like a tornado or something. And so now every day we're like, what's the wind speed today? So, and we would assess, like sometimes we were going to do something and if the wind was too high, we adjusted to do something on shore or something like that. So we were constantly planning and adjusting and figuring out how are we going to meet our goal. And it was just, a, it's just a real straightforward example of formative assessment and planning that leads to the summative assessment of, with the evidence that lent, uh, lent us to our outcome. So I just sort of like that um, with to show that that's something we do in everyday life that sometimes we forget we actually do it in school. Okay, so uh, one th so think about that when you are planning your learning for the students and your assessments, is it leading to the goal? Because for example, like if my daughter and I planned a trip to go plan, let's, let's go skiing while we're in Hawaii, has nothing to do with meeting the goal. So think about that when you're planning, what's your North Star? What's the outcome? What's the goal you want your kids to get to when they're doing, when you're assessing them? All right, so just to sort of summarize back again. So the assessment, the summative assessment is sort of getting that big information to evaluate progress towards the learning outcome or did they meet the outcome? And the, uh, the ongoing dynamic, often formative, but not always, it can, it can sort of be both, is that the formative and the ongoing assessment, it's it going for the goal. Am I using feedback? Are they making progress? Am I flexible? Am I dynamic? Am I ongoing? So that's sort of just in a nutshell what, what assessment is. And like I said, you, you can go to those links I've looked at and stuff to sort of get this. Okay. So it's everything you, you guys all said in the box, but just a little extrapolated a little bit. Okay, so we're going to do another mentee, and I want you to do, it's the same code, so if you still have your phone up, I'm going to share my screen again, and I want you to put it in the, mentee, in the mentee meter. What does assessment look like in your classroom? Get out of this one. And present this for you. There we go. Okay, so the same code, that 875728. What does assessment look like in your classroom? And it could be formative assessment, it could be um, summative, whatever. But when you're assessing, if we walk in your classroom, what would we see? Kathy, I'm looking back a little bit and uh, Lani had a question earlier. Mm -hmm. It says, will the teacher who failed to get through the child use this platform to encourage both parents and child at least to get them on track for learning. And I did ask him a little bit about the platform. He says, finding a path uh, to onboard success to be included. Yeah, I think, um, and Lonnie, going from what we talked about yesterday at the end, and I got your emails afterwards, thank you, is I think that's one of the advantages of remote learning, which, you know, there's a lot of disadvantages, but one of the advantages is that the teacher or the parents now know exactly what's going on with their kids in school. A lot of times my kids go to school and I don't, you know, until I get a report card, I don't know what's going on. So the one advantage of the Zoom and the, the online and some of that independent work with them is that there's greater communication and knowledge between the parents and the teachers about what's going on. Because a lot of times teachers don't know what's going on at home. Home doesn't know what's going on at school. So Lonnie, I think, yes, this is going to be a great way for you to be able to stay, or anyone, to be able to stay in touch better with the teacher to see what, what learning is going on. All right, so let's take a look here at some of these. And so um, let's see. So we got, oops. Um, so we've got projects. We've got written assessments. Um, Speaking test, I, I sort of, I clicked on here, there we go. Speaking test, drawing, exactly, IPAs, conversations, projects. I'm trying to figure out how to, why am I not scrolling in this? There's a way to, oh, enter to resume scroll. I thought I should be able to scroll, there we go. Okay, um, reading comprehension, listening comprehension, it's dynamic, it happens on a daily basis. Homework, student self-reflection, reading comprehension, painting, stories, IPAs, collaborative work. Exactly. And like I said, I'll save this. I can save this Mentimeter and I'll, I'll load it with our notes. Timed writing, storytelling, oral listening, videos, all those. Yeah, pretty much anything where you do something for the kids to show you what they know is assessment. Exactly. Daily checks, etc. Wonderful. Okay, so I think we have a, a good idea of what that is. Formative assessment, weekly, weekly summarize the assessment, etc. Okay, I'm going to switch screens here. Back to my PowerPoint. Okay, so that's what assessment looks like in your class. So let's just do some basic, you know, talk about some, some strategies for assessment, okay? And so it, it's really just, we wanna keep assessment, we wanna keep it simple, authentic, familiar, integrated, meaningful, student-centered. And so what, do, what does all, all that mean, Kathy? All right, so we'll go to the next slide, but I wanted to sort of give you just a, a one-time slide. But basically, keep it simple. 
what's essential? What do we need to evaluate their progress toward the goal? Don't overwhelm them. One of the things I think that I heard a lot um, with the Google Translate from teachers is that the kids just get apart from other ones, is that the kids get overwhelmed. They get a task that they're like, I just, this is too complex. I can't do it. I'm just going to type it in Google Translate. I'm supposed to write a story about something or a trip I took. I don't know half the words I'm going in, in Google Translate. So what's the essential? What's the simple, what's the essential information we need to evaluate their progress? And if you look down at the bottom in red, by we, I mean the teacher and the student. Remember, assessment is both of us, both of us getting and giving feedback. It's not just the teacher. Number two, keep it authentic. How are you actually going to use this information? So think about it. If I give them a quiz or, or an assessment or whatever, am I actually getting information that's going to help the student progress or that's going to inform my learning? And if I'm not, then don't do it because it's, not, it's, it's a waste of your time and a waste of the student's time. Number three, keep it progressive. So instead of saying, write this huge essay about this or whatever, break it down into steps, okay? So the first day is I'm gonna give you a graphic organizer and you just fill in some of the stuff, okay? And that helps with that vocab piece, okay? And let's, if you, there's words you don't know, let's, let's use word reference, let's use Lingay to look up the, look up the um, words, okay? Then the next step is let's just make an outline together or let's just work on the title. I, I teach ESL and, and one of the classes is a writing class and we really have to do this because it's a Columbus State and they have to write essays. And so we literally break it down into the bare bones from we, we brainstorm a title, we brainstorm the first sentence, the last sentence, and the, the main points in between. So, and I, I'm like, I wish I had done this when I was like in the high school classroom because it, it makes it much more successful for the students when it's manageable steps and they get feedback the whole process. Number four, keep it familiar. Is it something that we're, are we using tools that and, and things that we've already done in class, okay? So if, if they do, an assessment should be, should not be a surprise. It shouldn't be like, oh my gosh, I've never do that. I've never done this before. What are we using in class? That's exactly what we should be using for assessments. Keep it integrated. And a lot of you put that, I like that, that, that ongoing is that how, how can I get information as we go throughout? And I think we do that very well as language teachers. Keep it meaningful. So when I give feedback, I, I want to encourage them. I want to celebrate it. I want actionable feedback. Okay, what's, it's not like, oh my gosh, you're so smart or oh my gosh, you're so wonderful, which is nice. You know, we want, but we want to actually focus on the task and say, this is, this is what is working. Here's how you can make progress from it. Okay. And then number seven is student centered is how will my students continually self assess and evaluate their own progress so they can adjust their learning. So we go right back to that UDL again about it's not just me driving, you know, helping them become sort of that learned helplessness, but it's me helping them learn to adjust how they can fly the plane. They can pick their own meal from the buffet. Okay, so that's sort of, and this is from the Center for Applied Linguistics. They have great ideas if you want to go in there and, and read a little bit further on there. Yeah. Okay, um, let's talk about that synchronous and face-to-face -face time, because we all know that face-to-face -face time is going to be limited and could be gone in a second, unfortunately. Maybe things will change, but we are still going to have a lot of synchronous remote time where we're doing live Zoom meetings or Google Meets or whatever, whatever your means is of doing it. So when we're, we want to prioritize how we spend that interactive time, whether it's on the computer or live with the kids. Number one, number one, number one, I've, I've said this a lot and I still think it's most important, is we need to focus on the social and emotional needs of the students and the teachers. Don't forget about yourself, because which I don't think teachers have right now, is you have to focus on yourself. Because if you're not in a place a good place, you're not going to be able to help the kids. And the kids, everybody's traumatized right now, so don't forget about yourself. We want to use that synchronous and face-to-face -face time to build community and connection. And we're going to have some sessions on that later too. Prioritize the instruction that needs to be face-to-face. -face. Give live feedback in the moment. So, you know, we do a lot of interaction. Have that interpersonal interaction. And I know there's different things with the way schools are set up, but is there a way for you to do smaller groups throughout the week instead of always bringing in all 30 kids? Again, it depends on your, your schedule. And do some interactive games or activities, which is a nice way to, to, build, um, to build community. So let's break that down. So build community and connection, again, is just the social emotional needs of all of us because we don't have the community and connection. The kids are going to tune out. We're going to get burned out. Do you have a question, Nella? Or no, no. Okay. okay, sorry. Okay. Now the second one, this is in, I had this yesterday at the end of the UDL. So some of you might have left early at the very end we had this, where you prioritize what do we have to do together versus what students can do outside of class. So think of it this way. If it is something that you know you're going to have to say over and over and teach over and over or tell the kids, remember we did this, remember we did this, make a video. That way when the kid's like, wait, I forget how, you know, how, what's that whole thing about past participles or whatever, or, you know, whatever you're doing, make a video. So if it's not some, if it's something you're going to do over and over, don't spend class time doing it. 
prioritize what has to be done together. We're doing a, a deeper lesson or something that's a little bit more intense, or I'm doing some sort of, you know, interpersonal conversation. So really think about when you are with the kids, either, either live or live on the computer, what has to be done face to face and put everything else virtual because it's so limited. Um, so another thing, do that interpersonal stuff, do flip, you know, flip grids and zooms or in Google meet, do live Google docs, do padlets, do like we did a Mentimeter, do a Mentimeter. I mean, it's very quick, but it's also very interpersonal and interactive. Again, number four, I was talking about small groups. You know, can you divide the kids into small groups where, you know, they do a Shark Tank presentation and the kids have to buy a product or they teach different classmates how to do a card trick or something like that, or, or they do show and tell, or a lot of teachers told me how they did scavenger hunts where they said, everybody run and find something red or something like that, or we did exercise together or yoga. I know my, my friend Beth is on here, you know, making her kids do Zumba or whatever in the target language. So think, again, it depends on your schedule, but are there times where you could bring in smaller groups of kids versus all 30. Number five, conversation circles. Again, depends on your scheduling and, and your time, but is there a way to bring kids in by proficiency level instead of by class? So if you know I've got a lot of kids across different classes or levels, or classes, I should say, that are all in the novice mid to high range, maybe just bring them in for some conversation. And then you've got kids maybe in your level one and two who are both at the same spot and we bring them in for conversation. Again, not saying it's all possible, but just throwing out some ideas about how to make, take advantage of that face-to-face -face time. Um, you know, do a Netflix movie and have kids bring snacks and make comments in the chat box in French or the target language during the movie and even tell them this is a formative assessment, you guys. So, you know, you got to make at least four comments and or, I don't know, whatever. But again, just trying to think of some other ways to do to take advantage of building community and get language out of it and get some learning out of it. Or interactive games I mentioned before, GimKit, um, or however you pronounce it, Jeopardy, stuff like that, where you know, if, if it's something that will build some community, let's take five minutes and play it or 10 minutes and do this or whatever. So again, that prioritize your synchronous and face-to-face -face time because it's something that we took, it, we took um, that's what I want. We um, didn't really ever think about in the classroom and all of a sudden now it's so precious that we gotta make sure we're using it to our full advantage. All right, the third one is that online learning doesn't have to all be online, and this is including the assessment. So we have cell phones, student choice and voice, choice boards with online, offline, and free choice options, fine arts, music, virtual tours. I mean, a lot of this is stuff we've talked about, I think, in other, in other sessions. Food, health, movement, exercise, graphic organizers, cultural comparisons, nature and outdoor exploration while the weather is nice. So here's some examples again. You know, let the kid make choice boards, let the kids choose what they can do and have a free option. This is sort of the first two bullets. Have online and offline assessments to choose from. And um, uh, I'm gonna show you something today with some ideas for that offline. And then next week we also have some things on offline, offline learning. Use cell phones the best you can. If the kids have it, they can take a phone, a picture. Last week, if you didn't see the Google Slides that Maria and um, Kendra did, where you can actually use cell phone pictures from an iPhone and you can actually like draw on it and, and do, um, I forget exactly how it would work, but you could actually grade like a picture on the cell phone because you could draw on it. Um, so just different things, you know, maybe that they're, they have to do sidewalk chalk art and, and describe, write a description about it and take a picture of it. Or they make those live paintings, you know, where you get a painting and you dress up like that and you get people in your family and you talk about it or write about it, or they make a sculpture or they make a, a music video or they do a, a, you know, German class got talent or show and tell, or they pre prepare and serve food to a, a target culture food to the family and video themselves going through the process. And that's actually an example we're going to look at. Like I mentioned, exercise, you know. They can make Venn diagrams, make memes, T-charts, cartoons, comic books, flip books. So there's all sorts of stuff that they can do that doesn't have to be online um, that they can do that, because they're on the computer so much as it is with all the classes. So let's think outside the box. Photograph and describe 10 different red things outside and talk about them or something like that. The goal is these are all different types of assessments that, you know, obviously you, you would bump it up and make it a little bit more what they have to actually do, but it gives the kids a lot of choice about, oh my gosh, I totally want to do Zumba, or yeah, I totally am going to go out and take pictures of birds, Kathy, and, and talk about birds or something like that. So think about that when you're designing assessments, um, whether it's formative or, you know, summative assessments, come up with lots of choices for offline, online I, there's so much stuff out there also with activities. I mean, I threw some stuff on here, but there's so much out there with ideas to, to grab from. Okay. Um, 
so we're going to talk about assessment. We said a, a big key to hopefully the sort of translator buster assessment is to make it a process and not a one-time product that's really so big that the kids sort of get overwhelmed. So Nala earlier had given you the link to this handout. It's the, make sure you put the two at the end to get to it. And I'm going to get to that also. And it's just an assessment that I was just sort of playing around with. It's not, you know, it's not perfect. It's not, it was just sort of brainstorming the whole Google the whole Google Doc thing, or I'm sorry, the Google Translate. I'm going to stop sharing so I can find my assessment here. But I thought it'd be helpful if we actually had something to look at together. All right, hang on for a second. I gotta find it. There it is. Okay. So I'm going to make this a little bit bigger so if you don't have it on your screen, or if you don't have a copy of it, you can see it. That's a little bit too big. Let me make it a little bit smaller. I'm 25. Okay. And this is kind of long and I didn't want to take the time to go through all of it because you can, you can look at it yourself also. So what I did is I tried to highlight the parts that, that I was thinking about the whole translator thing. And a lot of this you'll see is similar to the ideas that a lot of you put into the mentee or into the chat box. So this was, you know, it's just a mini unit. And if you recall yesterday at the end of the UDL, we talked about instead of making these huge six to eight week units that we're used to doing in the classroom, maybe we break those down into mini units units of three to four weeks or, you know, so things aren't quite so overwhelming for students because everything takes so much longer on online. All right, so we have some learning outcomes about preparing a recipe from the target culture, converting metric. Kathy? So, oh, yes, sorry, go ahead. Before you proceed, no, I have a good question here. Um, what about district level common unit assessments that are required among four buildings and seven teachers that are textbook driven and required my, by my district? Okay, and so what Suzanne, could you elaborate a little bit on the what about, like what do you mean by what about? All of the assessments that, all the things that you put on are things I would love to do, but I'm tied to them. How do you, how do we do that in this situation? Oh, I see what or you're saying. That, yeah. <laughs> Why are you tied to them, I guess, is my first question. It's our, it's, that's part of my job and that's our curriculum. Is um, I mean, as a department, are you able to discuss a little bit, or is it that the district says everybody has to have common assessments? Um, the district, yes, the district, we're up for renewing next year where we can hopefully get away from this and towards proficiency, but we're tied to a textbook and the, 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 dis, the curriculum department made these tests and every teacher is required to do it. It's part of your common assessment or your data and all that all that stuff that goes mm -hmm. along with that. It's, am I gathering from what you're saying that it's not really a performance-based assessment? Is it more like a multiple not even, not even, not even touching the standards. <laughs> okay, yeah, you're right. So that's an issue to deal with, you know, after the crisis is over. Okay, right. 70% grammar. Yeah. Right. So I'm a firm believer in, you know, if that's the situation right now, you have to deal with that assessment. Is there a way though, and whether it's you, and I don't know your department, so I don't know how open your department is to it. Is there a way for you to embed a lot of these type of strategies that are going on right now that we're talking about on the way to them being able to take their assessment? Oh, I do all the right things to get there. I'm thinking maybe I just give it and just don't even count it. And I'm, so not, saying any, I'm not saying anything about that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I hear it's in the grade book, but it can be a whatever percentage of their grade kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, I, I think you bring up two good points. Right now is is not the time to bring up a, a complete overhaul <laughs> with with this year. The way right. But, no, but I have to deal with that, and and yeah. that's going to be this cheating is going to be all. You yeah. can just cheat right through the test. Right, and you may find that you know what it is not going to count as part of the grade book. I'm going to have something else that goes with it. That again, I can't. That's a district thing, so I can't really okay. say on that one. But. Right. I think it's nice though that you have this knowledge and awareness and the new standards that when you do go next year, when hopefully things are a little bit more calm, you can say, hey, we need to really realign to the, sta to the standards. So. Yeah, I think they're, they're, I think we're getting there. Okay, good, hopefully. good, 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 hopefully. good. <laughs> That's a great question. And probably one that a lot of people share. Yeah, um, and I looked, some people are in the comments. So great, everyone keep commenting in the chat box. Okay, so we had some different outcomes. It was about preparing a recipe, teaching it, you know, sharing it, giving it to your parents. And then notice, we've even included this in the new standards, if you were in the standards presentation, that we actually have one of the, liter we have a literacy strand now, and one of them is that use and cite online tools appropriately as needed. So it's built into there now for the students that you need to be able to, and that includes online translators and dictionaries and everything. 
So what I did in this assessment is I didn't, I put it in steps. And like I said, I highlighted the parts that I thought sort of were, I was trying to go with the translator buster part. So the first thing was just like a metric conversion practice. That was pretty straightforward. The next part was when they were choosing a recipe that there were a couple different things they could, and this was like a novice and an intermediate version, and they could choose um, an English recipe or a French recipe. But what they had to do when they chose the recipe was for the novice, they had to underline five words, whether it's French or English, that they didn't know. And if there were more than five words that they didn't know, they had to pick a different recipe to try and get away from them getting some big complex thing where they don't know any of it. Intermediate, I bumped it up a little bit higher because they could get a, a more complex one. So that was the first thing. It's just that knowledge of this is beyond what I can actually understand. I'm not going to do it. And they had to like get approval from the teacher. And what I did underneath that in red is I, I was digging around online and I'm sorry, I just did everything for French because that's, that's what I taught. But there were recipes on allrecipes.com and marmiton.org for French recipes that had step-by-step -step photos and videos that were very accessible for students. Another option is for the novice ones, you could just give them, here's two recipes in English, two in French that you can choose from that are recipes that you know that are appropriate and simple enough that they can do, they can pronounce, they can understand and they could underline up to five words. Intermediate, you may want to give them a selection or let them be on their own and choose it. So again, it's just right off the bat, don't even let them have a resource that's going to make them have to use Google, Re Google Translate. All right, going on to step three was actually understanding the recipe. And so this is where I'm talking about sort of systematic, ongoing, giving them feedback in, in the assessment as we go on, is that, okay, you got your go ahead for your recipe, now let's learn about what do I do when I don't know, know a word. And so, you know, your choices are you can use Lingy or you can use word reference for your dictionaries and that's it. Um, and again, and a part of it is like some of you said, you are not allowed to use Google Translate, you'll get a zero, there's a you know, code that you sign or whatever. So the thing is, if you chose a French recipe, just getting into there, okay, you underlined, already underlined words you don't know, let's do some thinking. What do I think it means? What does it mean? Where did you find your answer? And then what are you going to do to help you remember this word? Because some of you put the issue with Google Translate is the kids don't actually learn it. So now it's like, okay, where did you find your answer? How are you going to actually remember this new word? Or what do you already know? So building on that prior knowledge and that autonomy again, that efficacy, how do I get there? So literally the same thing with the English recipe, except how do I say the word in French? Where do you find your answer? And what am I going to do to remember? So building the vocabulary that they need for the assessment before they're into the assessment. So we've sort of broken down the steps a little bit. Okay, this was 3B, which is something about metric, not really Google Translate. Number 3B, um, what, or 3C, is there's a lot of words, especially like in French, where kids find stuff on Google Translate and they can't pronounce it. And it's just like this horrendous pronunciation. So we ask them, what are some ways you can listen to and practice the pronunciation of these words? Google Translate, I'm not saying use Google Translate or not, but Google Translate is a way to practice pronunciation of these words. They could make, a, you could say, you know, I'm going to make, they could say, I'm going to make a flashcard set in Google Translate or something. I don't know. Again, if you want to even touch Google Translate, but make them tell you how they're going to listen to and practice the pronunciation. Okay, number 3D. Now you've got to write your recipe. In, if you had an English recipe, you've got to write it in French. So now we have done, can everybody mute? I think someone's unmuted. Can you, can you mute yourself? Because I can hear feedback. All right, um, so use the vocab that we've done in class. So it's not like they're just starting this from scratch. We've done stuff in class together. We have class notes, we have vocabulary, you have your chart, don't use Google Translate and just rewrite the recipe in French. Novice is just gonna be, think of novice, simple phrases, practice language. And that's, if you pick, if they pick an easier recipe, they can get that. If they chose a recipe in French, okay, the difference is now, okay, you have to do something different. You make a T chart or you have to, and you write the steps of the recipe that in French that are easy, that are complex, and where are you going to get the ingredients? And you can make this tougher for intermediate. And again, so they already have the recipe in French, but we still want them to get some sort of writing from the recipe. So it's like, okay, I know it requires milk. I have this in the refrigerator. I know it requires this. I got to go to Kroger's and get that. So again, another way for the novice to get, for you to get some spontaneous language. Again, the vocab that we've already learned, the vocab in the recipe, class notes, don't use Google Translate. Again, not saying this is perfect, this is just something I was sort of brainstorming out. Number four is that they're gonna actually have to serve it to the family. So if you look at the highlighted part, you have to come up with five expressions you're gonna teach your family members that they can use when you serve them your dish in French. So this may be something you've already done in class, you know, this may be, you know, help the kids find them ahead of time. Hey, you guys, let's all brainstorm as a class, things that we'd want to have them say. And then they have to actually teach it to this family. They have to help the family practice saying it. They have to help them pronunciate, pronunciate it, pronounce it. And then take a look at the reflection 
that they have to talk about what happened when they were teaching and practicing with the family. Was it easy? Was it hard? How much did they practice? And that could be like an English reflection. But again, that remember in the assessment process, there's feedback and there's also reflection on what's happening during it. Then we get to the actual assessment. So maybe A is that they do a speaking thing where they video themselves as they go through the recipe, they video themselves serving it, et cetera, and they narrate it or whatever, they upload it to you. Option B may be for a writing one, that they take eight to 10 photos of themselves of the food and serving it to their families and they just caption the photos on PowerPoint slides and there's just some instructions on how to do that. Don't use Google Translate. Again, so they have a speaking writing and an option, uh, a writing option. What about kids who don't have digital access? So again, we want to think of UDL and we want to think about providing, you know, eliminating the barriers. So maybe the kids can put it on a USB. They can do it on their computer and put it on USB and bring it to the teacher when you're face to face. Could they write a description on paper, take a picture of it or print it out and write the captions depending again on that. And ask the kids, say, hey, okay, I, what can you do since you can't do it the way we need to because of digital, what can you do? So again, a lot of times as teachers, we feel like we have to solve it, but go to the kids. They may be like, oh, you know what? I could probably do this. Or my brother has a phone and I could use his or something like that. So ask the kids. There are allies in this. They're not, you know, it's not us having to do everything. Kathy, what? I had a quick question. Yes. Um, yes. Would you show the students all the steps at once or go through the process with them one step at a time? A lot of people think one step at a time is best. I think, I, I think it depends on your learners, especially novice. I would think one step at a time, but know that the goal, you can maybe, I think I would tell them the goal is that you're gonna prepare like we had at the beginning. You're gonna have to prepare a meal and, and video or some way show yourself preparing it, serving to your family and having them react to it. So they know what the goal is, but then yeah, especially at novice level, I'd probably break it down. Intermediate, depending on your kid, they may be able to handle it. And there's some kids who are like, no, give me one step at a time. And there's other kids who are like, no, I got to see the whole thing. So I think it's know, uh, know your student type thing, as long as they know the end goal. So they have to at least know what the end product is going to be. That's a great question. And I think mm -hmm. there's different ways depending on your students. One last thing I highlighted on here where it says considerations, because for example, on this one, you had the option of speaking or writing. And when you provide these options for assessment, you have to think to yourself about, as you look right here, where I'm, if I'm, I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, determine the purpose of the assessment. If the assessment is I want this to be a speaking proficiency or a writing, a, a writing proficiency, then you don't want to give, you only want to give writing options or you only want to give speaking options, okay? But if the goal of this is really not to assess writing or speaking, but to assess content. Can they actually do the recipe? Can they actually compare it to another country, et cetera? Then you could provide written or spoken options. So think, that's what I mean in this last paragraph. When you're choosing the options for the kids, when you're providing you know, that, that last piece of UDL about different ways to do it, determine, am I looking for a specific skill? Then make sure all the options are aligned to that skill. If the skill is really not the issue, it's more about the knowledge piece of it, then you may be able to put speaking or writing, and that may help some of those learners who feel like, I, I hate, I'm, I'm anxious, but I'm great at writing or something like that. So we make sure that's clear. Okay. Good um, question I'm looking, here. Yeah, I'm looking, um, is it the one about the cooking? Yes, the option for people who can. It, it, exactly, can. and that is exactly, that's a perfect question. That's a perfect UDL question that you may be like, yes, I know my kids can do this. I know they can. Throw in the chat box, everybody. And instead of me always having to come up with the answer, I'm totally making you guys be the students. So what's the option? You got kids who really, it could be a financial difficulty to do the cooking. Throw some options in the chat box. What could you do instead? Because that's a very valid, or some kids are like, I don't want to video my house. I don't want to video my kitchen. What do you guys think? What are some options to that? Props, drawings, photos. That's a great one. Yeah, they could use props. Um, yeah, just use, they could do it on, yeah, they could just do pictures of what they do. Yeah, pretend you make the food and what your, your dad thought of it or something. Yeah, so great for great options. Yeah, exactly. So thank you for those, for everyone who's throwing that in there. Yeah, maybe there's kids who are artists and they're like, and maybe that even is one of the options. Yeah, that you don't have to actually do the food, but you have to take pictures of what the steps would look like. And maybe they use the pictures from the recipe site and they caption those pictures. So great, great idea. A collage, wonderful. Yeah, great idea. Perfect ideas. And that's UDL. That's exactly what we're doing, where it's, if you have all these options out there already, you're not having to create something separate for every kid. Those are great ideas. You guys are like rocking the UDL. All right, and then the last thing I threw on here was a reflection on the actual assessment. 
And it was just a real quick thing the kids could do it in English, but it's, it, remember, it's feedback for you also and feedback for them, where they just rate the, the assessment, okay? So like number one, was it easier for you to break this into individual parts, rate it one to five? Could you find the way I did it with, could you find all the language you needed by using the things we said? Did you learn new information? Did you enjoy teaching <laughs> French to somebody? You know, did you enjoy preparing it? Maybe someone's like, no, I hate doing stuff like this. And so, you know, okay, next time it's got to be an option of, you know, there's got to be an option of not sure with your family or something like that. Six A, B, and C, have them tell you why they chose their option. Why did you do a video? Why did you do a slideshow? Why did you do something else? Know why they're doing what they're doing because that again helps us plan the, you know, that whole jagged learning profile gets out. What are, what are the needs of my kids and how do I break down the barriers? And then number seven, just ask them flat out, how do I make this better? And just like the question that came in the chat box, yeah, but what do I do if a kid can't afford it? And so you already gave, and everybody gave examples of how to make this better. So again, this is not, like I said, it's not a perfect activity. It was just sort of a brainstorming thing because I always think it's easier to talk about stuff if we have something to look at. So what I'd like to do now, let me get back to my PowerPoint. I feel like every time I like share something, I lose the previous PowerPoint that I was on. Hang on just for a second, folks. Get back to sharing. What I want to do now is because I've seen like great ideas coming into the chat box. So let's just do, this is where I actually want to do some vocal sharing. If you feel like you're like, I'm tired of never getting to talk in here. Or you're like, maybe you're like, I hate talking in here. Um, it, before, or, or yeah, so let's do this. So think about assessments that you give and let's just share out for about five minutes. What are some ideas that you do in your class, in your class, where you make an assessment that really is sort of an ongoing assessment process versus just a product. So, if you want to share, Nella, I'm going to ask you if you can run the chat box. Share some ideas with the group. Maybe just real quick. You know, we don't. We only have about five minutes to talk about this because there's one more thing to do. But what are some ideas that you do in your classroom that you where you sort of break down assessments? Um, keep a portfolio of their assessments. Okay. Show how they build and recycle. Yeah, there's some great online portfolios out there. Well, you can just do it even, I think we put a link a couple weeks ago to one for like those digital, digital notebooks. There's a whole video on that that someone did using Google Slides. So that's a great one. Yeah, so those. And if you want to, you can put in the chat box where you can talk. If you're like, I don't want to talk, feel free to put stuff in the chat box. Um, weekly one minute minute videos that will help them prepare for their 10 minute final exam video. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. So they just do short ones to help get ready versus a big one. Good. Um, Stronger student to demonstrate for mm -hmm. you. Yeah. I don't know if Leslie Chapman from Syracuse. Katie wants to share. Yeah. Kate, uh, Heidi, go ahead. Yeah. Hi. Um, so my students write in a diary five days a week and in them warm up in the morning when they're before at the start of class when they're working on something else they have their diaries out and I walk around the room and give quick feedback to all of the students and I ask the diaries to be focused on to talk always talking about real things about their lives but using the content of that unit or what we're working on right then it gives me a very easy way to assess on an ongoing basis how they're grasping the material can I give you a quick put you on the spot and you don't have to answer if you can't, but what are you envisioning to do that if you don't have the kids face to face or like, what did you do during remote learning for that? Did you, did you find a way to, to do it remotely? Actually, I didn't, I didn't find a way to do it, but I would imagine you could do something like a, um, you know, some sort of Padlet type thing. Oh yeah. Some sort of a, I, I think there might be yeah. something like that. Um, the nice thing about it being, in the classroom is that students aren't sharing with all of the other students because sometimes they actually share personal things. And so I really like to have that one-on-one -on -one interaction. So that's gonna be, that is an issue for how to do that one-on-one uh, -on -one with students in a remote setting like via Zoom. Yeah, but I love how you're just like Padlet right there or a Google Doc or you know Mentimeter, one of those. Yeah, what I'm doing for the online setting is instead of you know have the diary, but at the end, it's like my exit slip. And then I already know what um, they're going to be writing about for their assessment. So, for example, let's say their assessment is on um, 
using the imperfects. So describe um, uh, adjectives and what they enjoy in their free time. So describe how you were when you were a child, describe how you are at present. So that's the exit sleep for one week. And then the following week or the following lesson, uh, what did you like doing in your free time when you were a child? Tell me two things. What do you like doing in your free time at present? And then so we just build up towards the summative assessment by having those exit sleeps addressing all the items that are going to be included in the summative assessment at the end. What a great idea. Yeah, exit slips. I'm looking, I'm just sort of looking at here too, where you have um, like the graphic organizers are just huge. I mean, for every level that if they have that graphic organizer, I think even kids just feel better about that. Anybody else? I also had share? discussion boards. Oh yeah, like Google Stream has that discussion board. Schoology does. I don't know. Um, yeah, oh, directions to find a mystery place for another student to follow. Yeah, role um, play. Did it, did everybody share who wanted to share? Did, did Arate share? Was that who just talked? Um, I'm Arate. I have oh, not shared. Go. Okay. Um, I was going to say one thing that I like to do that feels like a process focus is um, doing jigsaws with interpretive reading. So if I have a topic, um, often a cultural topic, I'll give half the class one reading and the other half of the class a different reading. And, you know, the first part of the process is finding certain pieces of information in their article. And then the second part of their process is sharing information and, and finding out which information comes from which article. And so there's some interpersonal communication there that's required. And then there might be some writing and it might show up on the assessment, but there's this whole process that involves these different articles. And you can do that with videos as well. Yeah, I think, and it, it just gets right back down to what you said before about if we break down the process and help the kids have the support they need. And again, we're still going back to that that umbrella of, of online translators. And again, it's not a it's not a miracle solution, but again, if we can make the information they need accessible in other ways and help them figure it out, things like exactly the things that, you, that you're all suggesting, suggesting, hopefully that takes away from that whole Google Translate thing. I'm looking at like the role play yeah, those just real quick role plays. We have uh, KB Jordan and Kayla want to share. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, I am Katia Jordan. What I did in this online experience was that was kind of like a hassle for me as a teacher, but <laughs> I made these daily questions. So I created in the, my Google Classroom a daily question. So every day, because I wanted to make sure that they log in in right. my Google Classroom. So I began, I was uh, teaching Spanish two and three, and I began like, um, dime the day, the, dime la fecha de hoy, write the day, write today's date. And then I could see, I could monitor who were uh, following, you know, my instruction or who were in their own pace or who were just in the limbo that they couldn't even know what was a verb, what was a subject. If I was teaching present tense and adjectives, I asked them, dime como te sientes, how do you feel? Y por qué, and why? So they needed to write me in Espanol. So every day, every day, and at the end of each uh, two weeks, the people who had more than uh, for mistakes, they didn't, they didn't have an extra credit. So because of the extra credit, you say extra credit and they are there. I know. I, I have to do it. And they were still like, Senora, Yora, why are you doing this every day? Because you need to check if right. I have a new uh, announcement to give you, if I change something, if I am, if, if I, if you guys are following me. And that really, really helped me out. Yeah, and I'm looking at one of the questions was, how did you do this every day? You have so many kids, how do you grade it? Um, that I'm gonna, we have like two minutes left. And so I, this presentation is way longer than I knew we never get through it. So I put some extra stuff in there that's gonna be later anyway. I, but I, well, how I graded it, I just saw the answers, like this is good grammar or not. And yes, you got the point. You didn't get the point, okay. But um, stop using translator. I was really, really like, uh, you get a point, you don't, you don't got, you didn't get a point. Yeah, it was a hassle for me because it was 2 a.m. and I was grading that and I had to, you know, okay, what is the question for the next day? But yeah. that's the only way 
my students, your students would follow right. And if that, and sometimes it is if they don't have the motivation to do it. You know, if you look yeah. at the slide I put on here, I advanced a couple slides. There's a there's a couple things on here about pre-assessment that I, we're just not going to get to today, but that's okay. I'll do it on another another week. But I do want to point out this slide because it sort of goes to that about how do I grade it that we all know formative assessment and the sort of an analogy is, is planting the seeds to help them grow and then summative assessment is sort of okay the plant's grown now and it's ready for harvest so let's see if it did it turn out the way it, it needed to turn out and it was interesting because i was reading the stuff by marzano and he you know his thinking was that you know the, the summative assessment if you're consistent not just on one assessment but you have a lot of summative assessments that students are consistently performing on that that qualifies as evidence of meeting the learning outcome but that formative assessments, you know, those things we're doing ongoing to help to really give feedback to both us and the students, they don't count as meeting the learning outcome, which gets to the point, and, and there's a whole article underneath that, and I put the link to it, and this is from that guy's blog I was telling you I really liked, oops, um, was that should we grade formative assessments, which is exactly what sort of the question was, where you're saying, oh my gosh, I spent, I was up till 2 a.m. grading these, and someone else is like, I don't even grade it. I just look to see that they did it. Now, again, there's always that, that great incentive that you mentioned. Your kids wouldn't do it without the incentive. But, um, it, you know, is it a completion grade? But it's a good, it's not a discussion to really have today, but I thought it would be a nice one that you might want to go and read about do we grade formative assessments? Since, since formative assessments are just sort of checkpoints to see where they are in the learning process, it's not evidence that they've actually attained the goal should we grade them or do they count as much or do they only count a little bit so just a little you know a little it'd be one of those things that i'd love if we could all meet live at the ofla conference sometime and sit and talk about it like a big theoretical discussion or philosophical discussion but think about that with the grading because that's an issue is all this grading is like do you have to grade everything that you're grading um, it is 12.15, so I know some of you have to check out. So I just want to show you what's in the rest of the PowerPoint. I'm, I, like I said, there'll be a, I'll have to do a separate one on feedback. But let me just show you really quickly, and then if you have to check out, that's okay. We'll record it. But um, there's some things about feedback from John Hattie um, and, and Valerie Shute. I just wanted to show you really quickly the ODE rubrics. We have um, single point and, and full rubrics to use for performance tasks, like at the end of a unit, and they're for interpersonal, presentational, interpersonal. We have the, they're adapted for ASL if you teach ASL, and the rubrics can be used for all language levels. And then there's a document to, to give the scores, and then you can find all the rubrics there. If you don't know what a single point rubric is, they're really nice, and it's basically where you just have the middle column tells what the expectations are, excuse me, for that assessment. And then the left side has what am I doing well, the right side is, you know, what am I, what do I need to work on? So in the ODE rubrics, you determine yourself, okay, this, you know, if you look up where my cursor is, okay, this is a, a novice high task. I'm, I'm expecting novice high language out of this task. And so this is nice for the teacher to, if you want to give the feedback on the left and right side, but it's also good for student self-assessment, which is really what the purpose of it was, that the students sort of look at that and say, okay, what did I do well with vocab? What did I do, you know, what do I need to work on or whatever? So single point rubrics are really nice to make it easier to understand what the criteria are. When you look at these rubrics from that link that's on the slide, the second page of the rubric has like the full teacher version where it explains what does strong, good, developing, and emerging actually look like, like the, the categories above the top. So I just wanted to show you that as, I know the session's sort of over here, but I wanted to show you that because rubrics are a natural part of assessment, just in case you, you know you don't go to another one. The other thing we have is we also have proficiency level rubrics, which are, you have a no, anywhere from novice mid, novice high, intermediate low, up to advanced low. And it's the same thing. We have a single point version where it's like, okay, here's an intermediate low. What, you know, here's how you meet intermediate low. Here's how you'd be a little above. Here's how you'd be a little below or, or how, you know, where you could grow. And then the second page has more, all the descriptors of what intermediate low would look like. So um, anyway, that, like I said, there's a lot in there. So I, that's all I have for today. I don't, if you, you know, you're welcome to, if you have questions you want to ask, if you're like, no, I'm done. It's been an hour and a half. I got to go. So but are there any other questions on there or? Yeah, I should be able to get everything up for you by tomorrow. Usually the videos take about 24 hours. But if you're good to go, feel free to sign off. If you have some questions, feel free and I can say a little bit and answer some questions too. Oh, and make sure you save the chat if you haven't left already. You can, I'll save the chat and post it, but you can also save the chat if you want by clicking those three dots at the bottom.
Anything in there that we missed, Nella, or are we good? Oh, uh, can you, Nella, can you put in the box, Daisy just asked where to find the um, yes. past videos. Yeah, put in again that ODE OFLA meetups thing. Mm -hmm. We had a 158 people, so I didn't beg in vain for any trace. Is that what the final count was, 158? We were at one point at like 163, 164. Yes. And yeah, I figured that online translator was a big draw. <laughs> and there's still no real answer to it, but I'm hoping that at least it's really, it's the design. of every language educator's existence. Yeah, and Google, like I said, there's some, some good stuff in there for quick, you know, for quick stuff. But, um, and like I said, when I went in there and saw you could make your own stop recording.